In 2007, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a document called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This was a document that had been in the works for a long time, uh, was the product of uh, hard effort by many, many people. Uh, and it, for the first time, uh, in, a, in a global sense, uh, recognized the collective rights of the indigenous peoples of the world. Lots of countries, uh, in consequence of their signing on to the Declaration, have started <clears throat> looking into uh, how to create domestic legal regimes that recognize the collective rights of indigenous peoples within their territorial uh, limits. Uh, and countries which have had such regimes have been encouraged to uh, do things to make them more consonant with the provisions of the Declaration. One of those latter countries is the United States, which <clears throat> has had uh, uh, a legal regime recognizing collective rights of indigenous peoples since the beginning, uh, as evidenced by uh, or experienced through treaties between the United States and Indian nations, uh, dating right back to the first years of the Republic and, and beyond into the British uh, colonial era. Uh, the United States uh, has seen indigenous uh, Native Indian, Native American uh, political communities as being legally separate uh, and as recognizing, or as exercising rather, uh, inherent sovereign power, uh, which is to say power that hasn't been delegated to them by the United States, but the same sovereign political power that they've exercised since before Europeans arrived in the continent. And that's the way US law sees this issue and always has seen this issue. There have been fluctuations in policy uh, over the years between uh, in, in, uh, uh, sort of further uh, support for separate uh, tribal sovereignty and uh, a desire to assimilate individual tribal members into the broader political community. Uh, that's a different topic, the fluctuations in policy, but since the late 1960s, uh, early 1970s, the US has been fairly well settled in a policy of encouraging uh, tribal sovereignty, uh, encouraging tribal self-government. Now, the principal agent for the creation uh, and uh, exercise of uh, this policy is the US Congress and the US executive, which is to say the political branches of government, but that doesn't mean the court hasn't been involved. And in fact, the Supreme Court from the beginning uh, has been very uh, closely tied to uh, the, the creation of uh, the process of creation of a policy governing the relationship between the United States and the native peoples uh, who occupy lands within uh, the territorial limits of the United States. Uh, so we have three separate sovereigns, uh, and which is to say the, the federal government, the state governments, and the tribal governments, and we have multiple players within the federal system in, engaged in helping to define from the, from the federal government side what the, what the boundaries of this uh, relationship are. Now, the Supreme Court's role is what I'm gonna focus on in this lecture and in two subsequent lectures. Uh, and I, what I wanna talk about are, are three cases that uh, were foundational uh, in defining the, the framework within which the United States would operate when relating to uh, sovereign Indian nations in the United States. Uh, these three cases were all decided by the, the Marshall Court. Uh, they, the uh, opinions that we look to in each of these uh, uh, were authored by Chief Justice Marshall himself. And so uh, for these reasons, we call them the Marshall Trilogy. The first of these cases is the case of Johnson versus McIntosh, decided in 1823. The second is the case of Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, decided in 1831, and the, th the third and last is the case of Worcester versus Georgia, decided in 1832. Those latter two cases are going to be the subjects of different uh, separate lectures. Uh, but I want to talk now about the first and earliest of these cases, uh, which is the case of Johnson versus McIntosh. Now, <clears throat> Johnson versus McIntosh uh, was a land claim. 
uh, prosecuted by a group of land speculators who were called collectively the United Illinois and Wabash Land Companies. Uh, one of their shareholders was Johnson, uh, Thomas Johnson, who had been the governor of Maryland during the Confederation period and briefly an associate justice of the Supreme Court. He died uh, in the early stages of the litigation as the case was being put together and his place was taken by his two heirs, one of whom was also named Johnson, so we still have Johnson versus McIntosh. Uh, McIntosh I'll tell you about um, momentarily. The, uh, the land claim uh, arose uh, in uh, 1773 and 1775 when speculators from Philadelphia and Baltimore sent agents out to what would become the states of Indiana and Illinois to see if they couldn't buy some land from Indians. Uh, and they ended up finding uh, two groups, the Piankashaws on the Wabash River and various of the Illinois nations uh, who were willing to uh, enter into treaty relations with the speculators uh, under which a vast amount of land uh, was transferred uh, to the speculators. And these were two separate transactions. As I mentioned, one in 1773 and 1775. These purchases were, were illegal. They were affected uh, in violation of a British Crown proclamation in, uh, that had been issued in 1763 uh, in which the King of England said, no one can buy land from Indians west of the Allegheny Mountains without my permission. And these guys had no Crown permission, yet they went out and did it, uh, did it anyway. Uh, so it was a clear violation. Uh, the, uh, the local garrison commander allowed them to, although he was somewhat suspicious, because they produced to him what purported to be a legal opinion of the top legal advisors to the King of England, uh, Lord uh, Camden uh, and, uh, and York, and which so we call it the Camden-York opinion, uh, which seemed to suggest that the proclamation had been repealed. Um, but in fact, what they had done was to take an older proclamation and edit it strategically so it made it look like the proclamation had been repealed. It was a legal opinion that had removed restrictions on individual purchases of land in India, not from the Indians. <laughs> and so a little bit of artful editing took care of that problem. And the, uh, uh, so the, the, the garrison commander allowed them to go ahead and, and make the purchase. But there, was, uh, but there was concern about it, and, 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 and communications went back to London. Uh, can, can they really do this? Uh, the reason that the king had prohibited purchase from the Indians is he, he wanted to avoid war on the frontier. They just finished fighting the French and the Indians. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety that individuals would go out and abuse Indians and land transactions, and suddenly we'd have a, another war in North America on our hands. Uh, and consistently, the British officials who responded said, no, they, they, can't, they can't do this. This, is, this. And we can't believe this legal opinion was actually issued by these guys. We'll take a look and see. Now, my, the dates, again, 1773 and 1775, there are other things going on here then. Uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> Battle of Lexington, dumping of tea into Boston Harbor, uh, and the uh, convening of a, of a Continental Congress, which in 1776 will declare independence. So the Crown's fairly distracted. Uh, and these, uh, the consequence for these land purchasers is uh, they sort of get away with this, although they have no recognition uh, by any official of their, uh, of their title to these lands. So the land company, uh, with a non-denied claim and revolution in the air, decided that if the British weren't going to recognize their title, there were other places they could go. Uh, so they went to Philadelphia. They went to the Virginia Revolutionary Convention. Uh, and they started lobbying because they wanted somebody to say, somebody in a position of authority, yes, you own this land because then they were off and running. They could sell it, they could settle it, they could do whatever they wanted to with it. But no one would do that. And years passed. Uh, they never got official recognition from any body with authority to do that. On the other hand, they never got denied by anybody with the authority uh, in the legislative uh, branch to do that. 
uh, the Confederation, end, the war ended, the Confederation ended, the Constitution's adopted, a new government comes in, and every few years, there they are, the United Illinois and Wabash Land Companies petitioning some house of the federal legislature for recognition of title. This went on for 50 years until finally they came up with another idea, which is let's file a lawsuit. Now, that hadn't been possible before, uh, in a sense, because while there were courts out in the area where the lands were, they were territorial courts, and appeals couldn't be taken from them to the Supreme Court. And what they really wanted was the Supreme Court to say that they owned these lands. So they had to wait until a federal, regular federal court was created in Illinois, in Indiana, uh, after those areas, former territories, became states. And then they, they could and did file a lawsuit uh, and in the hopes that they could adjudicate it at the trial court level, take it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would say, yes, you win. And that's the case of Johnson versus McIntosh. Now, Johnson, I mentioned, was uh, a shareholder. He dies. His heirs take his place as, as plaintiff. Uh, McIntosh uh, is one of the great unsung, interesting characters of the early Republican period. He was a British immigrant. So he was from Scotland. A uh, soldier in the British Army during the Revolutionary War decided to stay. Uh, became something of a big deal in the Indiana Territory. He was briefly treasurer of the Indiana Territory. A land speculator uh, with William Henry Harrison, who was the territorial governor and later our shortest serving president. And, uh, but he, he was very independent. Uh, he took issue with the governor over a number of things, one of which was the way he treated Indians in treaty negotiations. He went public with this and uh, was sued for libel. Uh, he said that Harrison had been mistreating and abusing the tribes uh, in treaty negotiations, and he lost the libel suit, uh, and that practically bankrupted him. He, uh, he also married, at a certain point, a woman who was later alleged to be an escaped slave from Virginia, uh, an African-American woman named Lydia, who, based on the existing court record, was every bit as independent as McIntosh. I went through the court files, and she was a criminal defendant multiple times, usually for battery. Um, evidently, she may have had a short temper and a hard fist. Uh, but in any event, as a consequence of all of this, McIntosh and his family moved south, uh, abandoned the good citizens of Vincennes, which was the capital uh, at the time, and set up shop. When the company went looking for a willing defendant, they found McIntosh, and he uh, evidently uh, was only too happy to cooperate in a lawsuit that would upend the land titles, potentially, of all of the citizens uh, who, uh, for, of the territory, or many of them who had been uh, abusing him over the years. So, so they arranged uh, what we would call, in legal terms, a collusive lawsuit. Uh, in which the, the company identified uh, all of the grounds of, factual grounds of objection that had ever been raised against the Illinois and Wabash claims, and uh, McIntosh stipulated them all away. Uh, these included things like, you bought from the wrong Indians. No, we didn't, McIntosh says. No, they didn't. Uh, you didn't pay them enough. Yes, we did, McIntosh says. Yes, they did. So all of these things being stipulated, the court was powerless to overturn them. These were agreed between the parties. And that left only one issue for resolution in the federal court action, which was, were these barred, these purchases, by the proclamation of 1763? Now, almost certainly they were. And it would have been hard to imagine how uh, the land companies could have been found to have complied with the requirements of the proclamation. So the argument became the proclamation itself was unconstitutional under the British Constitution that the king didn't have the power to tell people they couldn't buy land from Indians. Parliament might have done that, but the king didn't have power to. And that was it. That was the case of Johnson versus McIntosh. Was the proclamation of 1763 constitutional under the British <coughs> Constitution? And that case went to the Supreme Court. It was heard in 1823. The companies were represented before the Supreme Court by Robert Goodloe Harper. And uh, who was a regular advocate before the Supreme Court and has his own story, uh, and Daniel Webster, uh, of whom you'll have heard, it was represented, uh, or the, the McIntosh's side uh, was also uh, represented uh, by two folks of whom you, you may never have, have heard. One was uh, William Winder, uh, who is best remembered as the military commander who led 
the rout uh, at the Battle of Bladensburg when the British showed up uh, during the War of 1812, uh, which enabled them to then walk in and burn the national capital. Um, so he wasn't very fondly <laughs> remembered, but he was, a, he was a regular Supreme Court advocate. And then an, a young guy named William Murray, who died soon after in a steamboat accident uh, on Chesapeake Bay and disappeared from history. Um, the fact that they aren't very well known is, is maybe interesting. Um, more important, maybe, uh, the fact that, uh, that they were paid by the Illinois and Wabash Land Companies. Uh, so both sides are, are paid by, the, by the, the, uh, the plaintiffs in the underlying action. Uh, they've got one issue because there's been uh, collusion in the creation of the, uh, of the, the uh, stipulation of facts. Uh, and the company's feeling pretty good. Uh, and despite all that, they lose. Uh, 1823, the case gets called in February. Uh, the court gets it. Uh, at least one of the justices is a little concerned at, at what's going on. There's word on the street that there's been collusion in this lawsuit, and in the end, uh, the court issues an opinion <clears throat> that finds that actually the, the proclamation of 1763 was a valid bar to these purchases. That's included in about a paragraph deep into the opinion. And then over the course of about 20 pages, the court creates something or adopts into American law something that we've come to call the Discovery Doctrine. And the Discovery Doctrine says, you know, the proclamation, okay, that's a ground for denying these claims, but there's another ground. And, and here's what it is. What did Europeans acquire? What did Native peoples lose upon the discovery of the New World? It isn't expressed this way, but you, you have a picture in your mind, I imagine many, many of you will, of, of a European uh, arriving on a beach and planting a flag saying, I claim this land in the name of, and then whatever the European sovereign. What did that mean as a matter of law? And that's the question that the court decides it's going to answer in Johnson versus McIntosh. The discovery doctrine says that upon discovery of the new world, the discovering European sovereign instantly acquired ownership of the underlying title to all discovered lands. And the question then is, so the tribes lose ownership of their lands. They retain a right to occupy them. And they can sell that right, but only to the same discovering European sovereign. That rule, that discovery rule, it, it, it may surprise you, is still the law. That outside of a few tribes, including the five tribes in eastern Oklahoma, tribes and the Pueblos, uh, the, the tribe, those are the exceptions, the tribes uh, in the U.S. do not own their land. The United States owns the underlying title to tribal land. The tribes own an occupancy right to those lands. They can sell it, but they can only sell it to the United States government, which is the successor in interest to the British crown. The, uh, this rule, uh, I think in part because we developed it so early, and it was in an opinion authored by Chief Justice Marshall, we have exported throughout the English-speaking world to other countries where there were indigenous populations when the English arrived. So it's the basis for the aboriginal property rights rule uh, in Australia, for the Maori land rights rule in New Zealand. Uh, it's the basis for Mayan land rights in Belize uh, and for uh, First Nations land rights in Canada. Uh, it's um, there's also some suggestion, people have told me, I haven't looked into it, that it's, it's, it's part of the basis for tribal rights in South Africa as well, uh, and in Uganda, uh, and maybe in other parts of the, it would surprise me if it weren't virtually universal throughout the English-speaking world. Now, um, wh where, did this, where did this come from? Um, it is a separate ground. The way it got applied to the land speculators was by the court saying, well, so um, since the United States owned the underlying title, they couldn't sell that to you. They could only have sold you the occupancy right, but the occupancy right can only be sold to the United States. So even without the proclamation of 1763, this purchase was invalid. They had nothing that they could sell to you, the land speculators. The, as I was, th this all became the subject of, um, of my first book, and. And as I was researching it, I, I, I had to ask myself at this point, having seen the litigation history, why all this was there. 
why is there 20 pages of the Discovery Doctrine when all they really wanted was a resolution of the Proclamation of 1763 argument? And, and that turned out to be a, a very complex story involving uh, politics, revolutionary war veterans, issues of federalism, et cetera. Uh, to summarize it very briefly, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, what, there was a contemporaneous issue uh, that the court was, was interested in resolving. The state of Virginia, in order to uh, fund its own revolutionary uh, militia during the, during the revolution, had promised veterans land out in what was then the far western Virginia. Uh, if you serve, we can't pay you because we have no money, but if you're a private, we'll give you this many acres. If you're a captain, we'll give you more, and, you know, for, if you serve for this period of time. And all the landed states did this. And so, uh, but eventually those, and so they, they made these promises. When the war was done, the militia uh, picked some representatives or the legislature appointed them and they went out to far southwestern Virginia to start surveying these lands. Turns out there was somebody else living there. <laughs> the Chickasaw Nation was living there because they were Chickasaw lands and the Chickasaws chased them out. And the state of Virginia said, oh, well, sorry, we'll, we'll come back later when you all are gone. That took a long time. And before it happened, uh, Kentucky became a separate state pursuant to arrangement with the state of Virginia. Kentucky County separated and became a separate state. These lands aren't in Virginia after 1792. They're in Kentucky. And Kentucky wanted them. So the dispute that was percolating in 1823 while Johnson was coming up was who, who owns these lands? Or do they belong to the Virginia militia holders who had some claim to them based on promises from Virginia or do they belong to the state of Kentucky after the Chickasaws remove? And the Chickasaws ceded them in 1818. So this becomes, a, it's a live issue from 1818 until 1823. Then they're trying to figure out exactly what to do. Well, <clears throat> what one of the principal grounds against the claims of Virginia is that Virginia had no real property interest to grant to its militia veterans because the Chickasaws owned these lands. And so at best, the militia people can file contract, breach of contract claims against Virginia for not carrying through on their promise to give them land. But those lands now belong to the state of Kentucky. That could have proven insurmountable, um, but for Johnson versus McIntosh. And, and I think what Johnson really is all about is John Marshall's, it's John Marshall's opportunity to say, you know, okay, we can take care of these speculators, who we want to lose. But we can also take care of the Virginia militia holders' claims. And we'll do that by recognizing in the discovering sovereign a right of ownership to the underlying title to lands, which then would have passed, in Virginia's case, to Virginia. So that at the time that Virginia, and this is how Johnson works in militia claims, at the time that Virginia granted these lands to its militia, it, it did own the underlying title. It couldn't grant them the occupancy right, the Chickasaws still retained that, but these militia guys owned the underlying title pursuant to grant from Virginia. It's a way of resolving that claim in the favor of, of the militia, and Marshall had all sorts of reasons for doing that, I won't take your time with now, but we could certainly talk about later. Now, the last thing I wanted to say is all of this, this, uh, this, this rule um, that resolves this immediate problem will, will very quickly come to be regretted by John Marshall and the majority of the Supreme Court. That's going to be the topic for my next two lectures on Cherokee Nation and Worcester versus Georgia, why he came to regret it and, and what the court did with it. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.